All right, we have Fernando. Uh, yes, Fernando is fine. <laughs> it's been a long day. Yeah, Fernando is going to talk about uh, using Rust uh, for your network management tools. Take it away. All right, thank you. All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Fernando. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. I work for the networking services team, mainly in focus on network management tools. And today we're going to talk what was our journey uh, building a Rust tool for network management. So, okay, we did not start with Rust. We started with Python. But after some time, we decided that we wanted to shift to Rust. So this is two talks in one. One is how we did build uh, the, the project in Rust and what we learned when moving from Python to Rust. Okay, so network management. What's network management? Basically, it's all the operations that you do to configure your networking. Routes, interfaces, DNS, uh, firewalling, whatever you do, it's network management. So um, it's a process that is quite complex because it requires a lot of coordination between user space and kernel space. Uh, we need to uh, check when we get notification for kernel space because other tools could modify the network status. We also need to communicate to, with kernel uh, uh, in order to configure stuff. So it's a quite complex task. And there is already a tool uh, which is Network Manager. Uh, it's by default uh, the tool that is in almost all situations used for managing uh, your uh, Linux network configuration. And we were willing to use it, and we were willing to build uh, in top of Network Manager because implementing everything was uh, really, really complex. So we created an MS state, and NMS state is a tool that communicates with Network Manager, uh, and it's a library uh, with a, a command line tool and allows us to configure the network with uh, using um, declarative uh, states. So you can define what do you want, and you don't need to care about how is network manager or how is the kernel doing, uh, and, and what's going to do or what are the dependencies. You don't need to care about any of that. Uh, NMS state is going to manage it, so it makes uh, everything easier. So as I say, uh, we started to build NMS state in Python, and one day we noticed that a lot of our users were willing to chip a binary and not uh, Python and don't use the Python environment. And well, there were also some performance issues because we needed to do a lot of operations. So we decided to give it a try to Rust. And we have a problem is that we have a library and a binary and we needed to move both, both of them to Rust. And also we already have a big uh, base of users. So we could not break them and we need to do it in a way that we are going to support, uh, we need to support all the features that we already did in Python. So well, we created uh, our own NMS state library in Rust, I will tell you uh, how, and also the um, NMS state CTL tool, which is the uh, command line tool. All right, so the first thing is that we are using YAML files and JSON files, and we are parsing them. So in Python, this was quite trivial with a schema, and we need to find a way to do it. In Python, we were using dictionaries, so the user could create a dictionary, and it was using a YAML library, it was quite trivial uh, to convert that, uh, that YAML into a dictionary. And we needed something in Rust to do this. So we end up looking at uh, CD. Uh, CD is a framework for serializing and deserializing uh, Rust data structures uh, efficiently and generically. We use it for uh, um, YAML and JSON, but it supports other formats. Um, this allows us to keep our declarative state, keep our API, so that was pretty good. And we noticed that CVD allow us to implement our own serializers and deserializers, so that was also a big plus because we could uh, do validation steps and simplify the, the validation uh, work when getting the uh, configuration file from the user. And then there, are, uh, there were a lot of decorators on Serda, so it was quite good to, uh, for creating aliases, uh, for creating uh, multiple helper functions, and also some uh, conditional uh, deserialization and serializations. So here is an example. Uh, for example, this is a interface state for a bond, uh, kernel bond, and we basically define it is up. It is have an IPv4 address with uh, this address with this uh, prefix length, 
and it is enabled, and then we define the link aggregation options. So uh, we have the mod options and the ports. One really good thing that we have is that we have uh, uh, partial editing. So you can define what you want to change, and we are going to merge it with what, what you already have on, uh, configured on the system. And about the decorators, as you can see there, we were able to use the decorator for, for example, accepting numbers as a string, accepting strings, accepting only the number, uh, custom strings, creating alias, renaming, um, yeah, all, all of that. And it was quite good. Quite good. So, okay, uh, we communicate with Network Manager, and we communicate with Network Manager um, to, to uh, configure the, the network state. And we have a problem is that before we were using the uh, Libanem uh, bindings, Python bindings, and they were not available in Rust. And we tried to create uh, Rust bindings, but it was quite complex because they used G-Object and we did not have G-Object and it was a big mess. But we noticed that Network Manager is uh, providing a Dbus API. So we say, okay, let's use Dbus then. And we noticed that there is a crate which is uh, Zdbus. And with Zdbus, we were able to uh, communicate with Network Manager using the Dbus API. And with the Zeta variant, we were able to um, encode the data structures that we were using to communicate with uh, Network Manager and configure the settings that we wanted. So uh, using this, we solve one of the problem, which is telling Network Manager what we want to do, and also fetching what already Network Manager has, which is also important because, uh, all right, there are some options that maybe we do not want to override because the user configured it that way. And for patch and editing, that is important. We need to know what the user configured and what the user wants to modify. So okay, uh, one problem solved. Then we have another problem. So Network Manager does not provide at all uh, real-time information from kernel, and we needed that because we also do verification. So when you configure something, uh, you, uh, NMS state, do a verification step, which uh, what it does is compare what the user defined with what is configured on the system. And we have a problem because Network Manager was not providing real-time information, and sometimes it took uh, quite sometimes to, to get the, the information that we wanted. And we were having some, uh, some problems on the verification. So we were looking for a library, and we did not find any library that satisfied our um, requirements. But we noticed that there is already a Rust NetLink library. And NetLink is a kernel API uh, for communication between uh, user space and kernel, and also, I think, between kernel components. And it was perfect. We could use Rust and Link, which is an existing library, to build another tool, which is Nispor. So Nispor only queries uh, information from kernel and show you in a uh, YAML file or uh, basically uh, proper data structures. Um, well, it was quite good because we started to contribute to Rust and Link because Rust and Link was uh, uh, an independent project. Um, and, and they didn't support everything, so we were able to help there. And currently, a lot of people use Rasnel Link, and it's a quite big project, and probably the one that most of the people use when need to work with Net Link and Rust. So we have one more problem. <laughs> OK, now we have Network Manager working, we have uh, verification working, validation working, we can read the configuration, we can do a lot of stuff. But then uh, networking is complex, and there is one thing that is called OBS, um, OBSDB, and Network Manager configure OBS, right? But they do not configure global OBSDB settings. And that was a problem because we wanted to do that. So how we did? Uh, we basically started to use sockets, and using the <coughs> RAS STD library for stream sockets, we were able to communicate with uh, OBSDB, uh, send, uh, sorry, send, um, send petitions, read what, what they already have a store on the OBSDB, and configure uh, whatever OBSDB settings the user wants to configure. So we created our own uh, cell JSON, well, using cell JSON uh, libraries, we created our own JSON RPC to communicate with OBSDB. 
Uh, this is uh, internal of NMS state. Uh, we have considered to um, uh, put it on a separate crate, but we did not yet. And yeah, then we had another problem. <laughs> okay, I promise this will end. We are going to have a solution. It will stop at some point. Uh, so we, ha we had users. The users were using our Python library. And some of them were willing to move to Rust. Some of them were willing to move to Golan. Um, but we were already developing a Rust solution. And some of them didn't want to move from uh, their Python code to Rust. So what we, did, what we did is create uh, bindings. And we create plenty of them. Uh, first of all, we created uh, C bindings. So C users could uh, use the Rust library. Then from the C bindings, we created the Python and Golan bindings. And finally, uh, one of the other problems that we had is that we got a huge uh, integration test uh, base, and we wanted to uh, reuse them. So with the Python uh, bindings, we were able to integrate the, Py the Python integration test that we had into our Rust library. So it was quite cool, because we were able to start building the Rust, the new Rust uh, NMS state, but at the same time using the Python um, integration test. And this way, we were sure that we were not breaking any existing uh, use, use case that we already support. So that's it. Uh, it was a success. Uh, and we are quite proud because most of the people that were using it uh, liked the idea, and even the ones that did, did not care about if you use py, uh, Python or Rust, we're happy because it, the change was completely transparent for the final user. If you were using Python, nothing will change for you. Uh, the code is the same. You don't need to do anything different. So it will be a transparent update. And if you are, if you are using Python and, and are willing to use Rust, OK, you need to change your code. But basically, the API is the same. So well, uh, you we're able to use the same uh, YAML files and the same JSON files, and everything will work. So we got a lot of adoptions. And right now, the um, user base of NMS state is still growing. And we are quite happy. Uh, also, it was, uh, we created Golan bindings because uh, OpenShift people and Kubernetes people were willing to use it, and it's written in, in Golan. So we provided them with uh, Golan bindings, and they really like it. So. Yeah, it was a success story. Uh, yeah. Um, so basically, that was our journey. Uh, I would like to hear, uh, I think we have time for questions. So please, ask whatever you want. I, I promise you that there are no dumb questions. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, any questions? Okay. Um, I wondered what your experience was in terms of time to implement in Rust versus Python. Oh, right. um, from a from a developer point of view. It, I think it took us around two years. Uh, two developers mainly working on it. Um, it was uh, full time. It was a long journey, but it too that it helped us a lot. The uh, having the uh, Python integration test working with a new library because we were sure that we were not breaking the existing cases and speed up the things a little bit. Absolutely. Do you have a feeling for how long it would have taken you if you had re-implemented it in Python? I mean, I know that's not really a thing, but like roughly how long so if you had said... Right, going back to Python. No, if you had said, right, we've got it in Python, but for no good reason, we're going to rewrite it from scratch in Python to make it cleaner, let's say, just as a, a like... How long does it take to write something in Python versus Rust? Or maybe it's not possible to, to guess. Well, I think it depends. Uh, in my opinion, and this is a personal opinion, uh, writing Python is much easier, but then you have more bugs. At least this was my experience. When I implement something in Python, I do it in, a, I don't know, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, but then I go bugs. And when I do it in Rust, it took me more longer, a lot of compiler errors, a lot of uh, unsafe stuff everywhere. So we need to avoid that. And 
but then it's quite stable. And I can say that uh, nowadays the Rust version, is, even it is uh, younger than the Python one, is more stable. We got less uh, bug reports and we have more users. Thank you. Did you run in, into any problems in terms of compatibility when you created C bindings uh, from the last code? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, to be honest, we did not have any problem. It was quite straightforward. Uh, we did not have any problem. I must say that the NMS Day library is, uh, what we spoke uh, to the users, is quite simple. So that makes it simple for us. We did not have any problem. That's, that's it. <laughs> okay, thanks. No problem. You mentioned that it was a long journey uh, when you were implementing this in Rust. So, and uh, could you compare what uh, you have expected in the beginning of this journey and with the reality? Okay, I must say that uh, uh, I'm not the only one person working on this. Uh, there is my teammate Gris, and Gris was the lead here. And I must say that I did not trust very much that we were able to do it in two years. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, in two years we are going to have Rust. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> but he was, he was right. So I think my expectation is that it would take much longer. But it was much simpler than what, what I thought. So also, I, I thought that we could have more problems with uh, finding the libraries that we need to do all the operations that we needed. But uh, I must say that uh, Rust have a great ecosystem. So, and the libraries that we are using, they are really, really well maintained, and that's that's great. Let's work for us. Uh, we have a question from the Matrix. Sure. Sounds a bit weird. Um, <clears throat> Tanya is asking, how long did it take your team to learn Rust, or did they know Rust already? No, uh, we did not know that Rust. I mean, well, we didn't know what Rust was, and we did some work on Rust. But we did one thing here. We started with Nispor instead with NM State. So when we noticed what are the missing pieces. We first started with NISPOR, which is much simpler than NM state, and we learned on the way. Uh, I must say that I'm also surprised with the, all the Rust uh, resources, that it was quite easy to learn, but we learned on the way. Uh, when we needed something, we started learning it, and then we revisited the code and we changed things. For example, initially we did not understood correctly how to use traits, so we did not use them. And then we noticed, right, traits are really useful, why are not using them. And then we started to implement traits everywhere and make it more flexible. Yeah. Thank you. Great. If there's no more questions, uh, right. yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs>